Lord, speak truth through my words and live love through our lives. Amen. <clears throat> I was taught in my preaching classes in seminary, and I've heard it a bunch since then, that you are never supposed to complain about the gospel text that you have been given to preach on. The day that they really said that, though, I was out sick. Because I can safely say that this gospel text in and of itself escapes my ability to use logic in this particular matter of faith. And then I thought, maybe that's the point. You and I are often reminded by our faith and by our Bible and by our Jesus that the world we live in is both beautiful and flawed. But faith calls us to find the way to navigate this minefield, this minefield of a creation that is both beautiful and flawed. God calls us to find that path, as radical or ridiculous as it is, find a way to love very deeply in some fashion the very people, among all others, who wish us harm, as well as to love deeply those who give us no second thought, as well as to love deeply, of course, those who would go to the ends of the earth for our well-being. Now, for the ones who wish us harm, let's love them safely, of course. Let's not put ourselves in harm's way. Love them safely, but genuinely all the same. So some of us are aware and some of us are just finding out that a group of us wrestled with this particular gospel text just this past Tuesday. And so what we did was we voiced as best we could what word or phrase stuck with us and where in our life the passage seems to be touching us. And finally, we shared what we think God might be calling us to do based on this passage, having read it several times, meditated, and prayed about it. And one of us noted that we usually see the Bible giving us guidance on how to be a good person, how to do the right thing. They pointed out how the Bible often helps us to understand and follow rules. But this passage seems to turn the message of rule following onto its head. Jesus clearly tells us to do something. That is, he said, make friends using dishonest wealth. That's the quote out of his mouth. Make friends using dishonest wealth. We are quite certain that church-going folks are not supposed to really do that. That's a head-scratcher. So a little trick, I guess you could call it, or just a, a neat thing to do that I've picked up over the years when I'm trying to find some more meaning in a Bible passage, what, I, what I've learned to do is to look at what exact passage comes right before the one you're studying, and then look at and read also the exact passage that comes right after the one you're studying. I won't say it's a secret key to answer all your questions about the Bible, but it really is a, a pretty helpful tool. And so while you're doing all of this, the question to ask is, what is the text that you're working with sandwiched between on the pages of the Bible, and how might those three passages compare and contrast to each other or guide us in a certain direction. So, since I was struggling to get something out of this passage, I said, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give it a go. And I looked right before today's gospel passage. Guess what comes right before today's gospel passage? Another story that turns common sense on its head. The story of the prodigal son. Now, I know you know the story, bear with me. But in that story, a youngest son takes his pending inheritance from his father and runs off and blows it partying. Then, after the fact, realizing how bad a shape he's in now, he comes running back to his dad with his tail between his legs and says, sorry, and his dad throws him a party. So, now, yeah, this is a beautiful story from the youngest son's point of view. His loving father takes him back in without hesitation, without punishment, without shame. But this story of the prodigal son is hard for those of us who identify in many ways with the older 
brother, the so-called Steady Eddie, which was never my nickname. <laughs> The older brother, who has always done as he was expected to do and who went above and beyond in his duties to his father, who never asked for a thing, he asked his father how on earth this was fair. The scoundrel, having partied away his inheritance, gets another party while the faithful son gets it. So that's the story before today's text of the shrewd manager, the story of the prodigal son, which... Spoiler alert, should be retitled, The Story of the Older Brother. And the text then that follows today's parable of the shrewd manager, it's another one that turns logic on its head. Got any guesses here? No, it's not Jonah and the whale. The, the passage after today's gospel is entitled, Law and the Kingdom of God. Now let me set this one up for you a little bit. I think we would agree that we're usually told in the church that as followers of God, before Jesus came, we used to follow something very burdensome called the law. And that is how we got closer to God, by following the law of Moses that you find in the first five books of the Hebrew Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But then as Christians, we're taught that through faith in life, in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, that we now get grace from faith rather than from the law. God's love comes through our faith, not through the law. So while we're expected to still be good and loving people, having faith in Jesus and following him replaces the onerous task of following the law. There are a lot of them, by the way, 700, 800 something laws. We're generally given the message as Christians that we are no longer under the law but we're under God's grace through faith. So in short, the message seems to be Jesus wiped out the law. But in this next passage that I'm telling you about, here Jesus says to us, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to be dropped. Did you wipe out the law or not? So we have these three head-scratching, paradigm-toppling passages in a row, thanks to Luke's version in his Gospel, chapters 15 and 16. You got the story of the prodigal son seems to say, don't do the right thing all your life. Just party like it's 1999, say you're sorry, and we'll throw you another party. Then we have Jesus today literally telling us, and I quote, Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Then the next passage that I mentioned, the law and the kingdom of God, Jesus says, he seems to say, well, we used to have to follow the law, but now, well, you still have to follow every letter of the law. So in looking across these three different passages, I came up with something. I've decided that all three passages are nonsensical on purpose. Hear me out. <clears throat> Maybe you and I are supposed to be of the mindset that nothing in this text today is as it seems to read. That this text is not supposed to make immediate logical sense. Maybe this is one of those times when a religious leader, in our case Jesus, says something so arcane to his followers that they all run around scratching their heads. So here is what has helped me with this one. First, if you have this idea, let go of the idea that the rich man in this story is our God. Let's have it at face value that this is simply, <laughs> this is simply a story about a guy who has so much money that he has to pay another guy to watch it for him. And some of you may breathe a sigh of relief here. We're just going to hold on. Sorry, Ben. That's a, no, no worries. All right. 
We're taking it all the way from the top. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so here's what helps me. First, if this is the idea you have in your head, let go of it. Let go of the idea, if you have it, that the rich man in this story is God, symbolically. He's not. Let's have it at face value that this is simply a story about a guy who has so much money that he has to pay a guy to watch it for him. And some of you may breathe a sigh of relief here. I do not think that you and I are expected to be the dishonest manager. Jesus is not literally telling us, nor is he telling his disciples in the story, go steal stuff. Nope, nope, nope. The story, perhaps, may well be about how, at times, being a follower of Jesus Christ means we have to sometimes do the good thing for God, even though it may not appear to be the right thing to the world. So there are times, you see, that God's ways and earthly laws are not the same, and it isn't always an obvious choice, which is which. Since we're already out here on a limb, let's just go out a little bit further. While we call the manager in the story dishonest, and rightly so, the dude is messing with his boss's money, one thing that he is doing, both before and after the confrontation with his boss, one thing that he is doing is forgiving people. Specifically here, he is forgiving the debts of poor people. Maybe he is radically sharing forgiveness in a way that you and I would not think of. And maybe that's the idea. Maybe you're supposed to think outside of the box when it comes to forgiving others. Maybe we're supposed to go outside of the box when it comes to sharing with others this grace of God called forgiveness. So as counterintuitive as it may seem, bear in mind that the manager has the power to do this. He does not have the authority. The rich man didn't authorize him to wipe out all these debts. But the manager has the power to forgive and he exercises it liberally. The rich man catches him and of course he's furious. He's about to lower the boom and fire the manager. And so what counterintuitive thing does the manager do? Now this defies logic. First he says, I've decided what to do so that when I'm dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. And then he doubles down on squandering his boss's money to the benefit of his debtors, which is exactly what got him in trouble in the first place. Then something else completely unexpected happens. Did the boss call the cops? No. In the process, the rich man, I contend, is inspired by this head-spinning, life-giving action called forgiveness. He's changed by witnessing it. He's converted. And he was simply a witness to it, not the recipient. I mean, this forgiveness cost him plenty. Even still, he then forgives his shrewd, now no longer dishonest, manager. He learns that maybe the grace of God here seen in these acts of forgiveness is so freaking radical that it makes no earthly sense, so why don't I do it too? He seems to catch the forgiveness bug and he praises the manager. And that doesn't make sense to our ears because it isn't supposed to yet. After all, true forgiveness is not an act of the brain. If anything, Forgiveness as an act comes to us from God, and it's an act of the heart. It's an act of the soul, not the brain. We don't think our way into forgiving ourselves or someone else. You don't learn to forgive by attending a lecture on it. We learn to forgive by witnessing it. We learn to forgive by experiencing it. True forgiveness is a radically loving and illogical act that might just be contagious. Forgiving something or someone is a spiritual deed that changes how we act without first changing how we think. Nonetheless, forgiveness is an act that will demand of us a lot of thought. Forgiveness is not simple. 
Forgiveness is not easy. I mean, when I need to forgive someone, I'm not mad for no reason. I'm not in trauma over someone giving me flowers or money or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. No, I'm stuck with trying to forgive something or someone because something really hurtful happened. Forgiveness is really hard. But for some reason, we have to be able to find it. We have to make use of it if we're going to truly live the abundant life that God in Christ wants us to live. Note, I said forgiveness, not reconciliation. You can forgive something. You can forgive a person without suddenly having warm feelings for them or wanting them in your life. Forgiveness is God's gift of letting go of what keeps us from truly living. So I'm going to try doing these things that make no sense sometimes, just because it might be the only way at certain times to live the way God wants me to. God, give us courage to do heavenly things that make no earthly sense. Amen.